this panel is especially uh, sentimental and special to us because it is in a memory of a longtime Georgetown faculty member, uh, Ambassador Howard Schaefer, and it is made possible by the generosity of a gift from his former associates at McClarty and actually Ambassador Schaefer, uh, Tezi Schaefer's uh, associates at McClarty. So we're very grateful to McClarty for the partnership. Uh, we started it last year. We hope it will last many, many years to come to honor Ambassador Howard Schaefer's memory. He was integral to the School of Foreign Service, and so it's a great way to honor his legacy. To tell you a little bit more about what uh, about Howie and what he meant both to Washington and to Georgetown, I have the honor of introducing Ambassador Bob Blake. Well, thank you very much, uh, Irfan, and it's great to be here. Um, my own association with India goes back many, many years. I was the DCM there uh, in the mid-2000s and was uh, had the privilege of being the Assistant Secretary in charge of South and Central Asia, so traveled frequently to, to India. As Irfan said, I'm um, very happy to now be a Senior Director at uh, McClarty Associates, and we are in turn very, very pleased to sponsor this panel today in memory of our beloved friend, Howard Schaefer, and for all of the young students here from Georgetown. Um, Howie Schaefer was one of our most distinguished South Asia hands. He probably had more experience in South Asia than any American diplomat ever. He spent more than half of his career there. He was our ambassador to Bangladesh. He was our senior person at the State Department in charge of, of the South Asia region. But more importantly, he was just a, a wonderful friend and mentor to so many of us uh, who uh, started to work in South Asia and looked to him for inspiration and guidance. Um, he had a long association here at Georgetown. He was uh, he taught uh, a famous course called uh, Practicing Diplomacy Abroad, or as it was affectionately known, PDA. Uh, I'm sure if he were here, he'd make some funny pun about that. Um, but he also taught, of course, the, the seminal uh, South Asia course and uh, Tazy carries on that, that great tradition to this day. Um, and for those of you who, who, who may not have read his books, I really commend those to you as well. He, he wrote some, some really terrific biographies. I, I commend particularly the one on our uh, Chester Bowles, our ambassador, who was the only ambassador to serve twice in, in India. And it's just a wonderful history of that time as well. But he also has written books about Kashmir and many, many, many other subjects. So. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure it's for us to, to honor Howie's memory by sponsoring this lecture series. This is now the third of the lecture series. I also have the honor today of introducing my good friend, Rich Verma, who is the moderator of this panel. I can't even see him except through the books here. But uh, Rich um, is the vice chair of the Asia Group now. But um, he and I served together in, uh, for, in Hillary Clinton's State Department. He uh, came up from Capitol Hill, where he was the uh, national security advisor and one of the most senior people on the Hill uh, with an extensive experience. And he brought that to the State Department, was head of legislative affairs. And uh, he and I served together for four years. Um, in that, and in that job, I must say, he was one of the most uh, the easiest people to work with, but also one of the smartest people, uh, and somebody who really helped to guide our relations and made sure that we were all actively engaging with the Hill, and just a, a lovely guy to work with. And he, may, he impressed so many people that uh, when uh, a vacancy came open to be our next ambassador, he was, of course, delighted to do that. He served with great distinction as our ambassador from 2014 to 2017. Um, continued the incredible expansion that we've seen of U.S.-Indian relations and strategic relationships, uh, made particular progress, I think, on our defense ties, which was very, very important and, and really began a lot of the, the, the defense progress that we're now seeing, uh, of course, on trade as well, and of course, on clean energy, which is, to this day, a very important source of, of cooperation between the United States and uh, India. He. Um, he, in addition to his background on the Hill, he had a, a distinguished career in business. And of interest to all of you, he's a graduate of uh, Georgetown, the, the law center here, and as well, uh, got his Bachelor of Science in, um, at uh, Lehigh. 
So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Rich to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Bob. Uh, thank you. Bob is really an outstanding diplomat and friend and has made such incredible progress um, over the years on, on South Asia as well. His contributions uh, are, are noted and, and lasting. I'm especially uh, honored to be here at the, at the conference. Um, what Bob didn't tell you is that right after I served in New Delhi, um, I became a senior fellow here at, at Georgetown. Uh, I got to know Irfan uh, during my time in, in Delhi. And one of the interesting and, and um, <coughs> kind of predictable things about elections is that um, after elections, you, as a political ambassador, you're basically unemployed. And, um, and Irfan um, called me and said, you should um, really find a way to feed your family and be affiliated. Um, <laughs> with us, which I was uh, really honored to do, and helped uh, work on uh, the first couple uh, conferences. And it's just so great to see it develop into, into such an important part of, of kind of national discourse now. We have a terrific panel with some incredible uh, panelists. The title of the panel is uh, Crisis Diplomacy in South Asia. Uh, for most people, that is, um, really involves India-Pakistan uh, relations. Uh, we, will, we are, I assume, going to focus on that, but you're not limited to that. To the extent you have questions, make sure they're limited to crises and to diplomacy and South Asia. That will probably return you back to India and Pakistan um, as, as our focus uh, area. So we're joined by, like I said, three incredible uh, panelists. Uh, Tezzy Schaefer had a 30-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, Ambassador Schaefer is recognized as one of the State Department's leading experts on South Asia. She spent the total of 11 years there, uh, numerous assignments, an author and a senior advisor at McLarty, uh, just a, a kind of legendary figure. Ambassador Hussein Haqqani is a senior fellow and director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute, served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2011, also an acclaimed author, scholar, um, again, delighted to have him here. And Dhruva Jaishankar right here on, on my left is a fellow in foreign policy studies at Brookings, India, New Delhi, and the Brookings Institution here in Washington. Um, I, I can honestly say probably um, the most sought after young uh, scholar and, and uh, in the field of kind of US, India, Indo-Pacific uh, security studies uh, as well. Um, I'm gonna really kick it off with a general question and, and Tezzy, if you could go first, especially because it, this is such a special uh, panel in honor of uh, uh, Ambassador Howard Schaefer just uh, just a titan in the field. Um, but I want to, um, I'm going to ask a, a question and then allow you to, to go first. But I want to I talk about the recent set of incidents between India and Pakistan and the tragic terror attack that occurred in Kashmir in the middle of February. And then the subsequent Indian uh, response, in, uh, February 27th, I believe, followed by a Pakistani response as well, just after that. I wonder. If, if in your experience you could say what was unique about this set of activities, how did it fit into the pattern? Uh, was it different than our, our prior responses? And, and we'll focus on India and Pakistan as of now, and then I'll come back to the US response as well. So Tezzi, over to you. Thank you very much, Irfan, and thank you very much, Bob, for <coughs> the warm introduction. Uh, as you can imagine, I was pleased and honored when Professor Nuruddin asked me to participate in this discussion. But I do need to take a brief detour before I tackle your question, Rich. Uh, those of you who know me or who were at last year's conference, I hope know how profoundly grateful I am to Georgetown and to Professor Nuruddin and to my colleagues at McLarty Associates for dedicating this discussion to the memory of my late husband. I spoke last year about how this memorial event brings together two strands of Howie's professional life, 
that engaged him passionately. One was relations with India, to which he had devoted much of his 36-year diplomatic career, and Georgetown, where in his post-retirement life, he had discovered the joy of teaching and made an amazing number of dynamic friends among the SFS students who took his courses on diplomacy and on US relations with India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. There were a few who took both courses, one of whom was going to try to get here today, but he actually lives in New York. Anish Deshpande, did you make it? I don't think so. I'm going to see him for tea tomorrow, okay. so we're still staying within the proper tradition. Um, but recent events have made this a particularly fitting way to remember Howie. Uh, Rich mentioned the attack in Pulwama and its aftermath. Howie's involvement with Kashmir goes back to 1964, when, as a young diplomat stationed in Delhi, he made a legendary political reporting trip to Kashmir. At that time, the valley was convulsed by outrage over the disappearance of a relic uh, of the prophet from the mosque in Srinagar. Howie was impressed by the deep disaffection he found, especially among the youth. The person who showed him around was a 19-year-old student activist whose grandfather sold magnificent carpets on the Bund in Srinagar. The student, Faru Katwari, remained a friend for life, eventually came to the United States, uh, is uh, CEO of Ethan Allen, and I believe has served on the board of Georgetown's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. I don't know if he's still there. So he is woven into several of the strands of uh, the, the backstory behind this discussion. Rick asked a question, but I'm going to take a step back uh, to which the answer to the question will be the, the last step. Howie's better known contribution to US policy on Kashmir was his 2009 book, The Li Limits of Influence, America's Role in Kashmir. And I brought a copy with me, not just for advertising, though it deserves the advertising, <laughs> but because the cover so beautifully captures uh, one of the issues that has come up every time anyone has tried to help India and Pakistan fix Kashmir. This is a sign, you probably can't read it from where you are, that says, warning, journey ahead prohibited for foreigners. Mm. You were approaching the inner line, but you are also approaching an inner line of Indian foreign policy. Mm. And uh, when Brookings suggested this cover, there was never any question. This, <laughs> this had to be it. Um, those of you who knew Howie also know that he loved words and he loved puns. Uh, the book describes U.S. efforts to move toward a settlement in Kashmir, starting right after partition and continuing up to 2008. You can divide this into three parts. Until 1971, U.S. diplomacy was based on seeking an India-Pakistan compromise and was tangled up in Cold War politics. Uh, that period ended, uh, well, in, in, from 1971 onward, uh, that being, of course, the year in which Bangladesh had its War of Independence. Um, and that became the issue du jour. Um, and uh, the, Kashmir was largely off the US agenda for the next 20 years, um, and largely because in the Simla Agreement, which finally wrapped up the India-Pakistan the, uh, India War over what became Bangladesh, uh, they had basically promised uh, to um, keep, keep away from Kashmir, although the two countries interpreted that agreement very differently. Um, and it became a source of discord rather than a source of peace. Uh, the third phase started in 1990, and that's the one that gave birth to the title of today's event. Uh, from 1990 onward, every significant bit of US diplomacy towards India and Pakistan both uh, was, in one way or another, crisis diplomacy. Um, 
in India and Pakistan were implicitly nuclear at the start of this period and explicitly so from 1998 onward. The US interest in Kashmir was focused on avoiding a war. That may sound obvious, and I think it is obvious in today's policy environment, but in the early years, Kashmir was the nickname given to dealing with India and Pakistan and their uh, birthing dispute. American efforts to find and pursue a Kashmir com compromise were consistently unsuccessful, despite the who's who of special envoys, American special envoys who took up the cause. The Kashmir effort that looked most promising, US and British-backed negotiations in 1962, in which the then amb US ambassador in Delhi, John Kenneth Galbraith, described the foreigner's role as hanging around like Banquo's ghost outside the negotiating room, <laughs> um, ultimately went nowhere. Galbraith also, in his pungent way, described the bottom line. The one thing on which India and Pakistan ag agreed was that they both hated the proposals that were being made by the Americans and the Brits. Um, U.S. crisis management dis diplomacy was more successful than the compromise-seeking variety. It did provide a means, or in some cases perhaps an excuse, for de-escalating India-Pakistan crises centered on Kashmir. Um, as far as addressing the underlying conflict, however, it didn't really try. The, American diplomacy was quite content uh, if they could move away from the brink of war. Um, in one case, there was a process that was supposed to go forward, which it sort of did. But it was a process that had relatively limited goals. Um, <coughs> I think both the Indian surgical strikes of 2016 and the recent events at Balakot and Pulbama fall into this crisis management category. So was there something unique about the most recent event? Um, not altogether unique. You had had incidents that were started by uh, a terrorist group, an activist group. You can fill in the name that best fits your understanding of them. Uh, that had happened before. That certainly was the case in uh, when um, the attack on the Indian parliament took place. Um, you had also had events to which uh, India, having been attacked in one fashion or another, um, responded. And the surgical strikes were certainly in that category, uh, as was this year's version. But they're not clones, and they're not going to be clones. Every time. Uh, there is an effort to find on the part of India, because the pattern recently has been that the first blow has been struck by a group based in Pakistan. Um, and India has looked for a way to respond, which, in my view, was designed to be in and out before anybody had woken up to what was going on. In other words, they were attempting to use the design of military response uh, to do what can't always be done, which is to keep a conflict between two nuclear powers <coughs> limited. Now, you still always have to ask the question, limited from whose perspective? And limited in what respect? Geographically? Well, Cargill. Each of these episodes opened up some new geography. Um, in the case of Cargill, uh, it was actually a military move by Pakistani troops into area that was administered by Kashmir. Uh, in the case of the episode that ended with the surgical strikes, uh, the uh, new geography was actually sending the Air Force into action. In the case of the events at Balakot and Pulvama, they struck within the undisputed 
territorial limits of Pakistan. And the two countries take different views over how much of that was considered new. But by somebody's reckoning, there was something new in each, in each episode. Uh, there was at the same time what seems to me like an effort, and I would say an effort on both sides, to keep things limited. Uh, and in the case of the Pulvama uh, attack, uh, the obvious example was the return of the pilot. Uh, I bow to Hussein's greater knowledge of the uh, inner workings of the Pakistan government, but it seems to me that basically Imran Khan concluded that he was better off without the pilot than with him. Uh, but this continued to try to keep the lid on. Uh, so keeping the lid on is something that India and Pakistan have gotten reasonably good at. Uh, that the US has found occasion to encourage. Uh, those desires went hand in hand. But I do not think that one can simply say that they've, they've figured it all out. Because every time there is some pressure point, in this case, India's election. And the longstanding feeling in India uh, that India made a strategic mistake by not responding militarily to the attacks on the hotels in Bombay. So that's the backdrop for our thinking this afternoon about how best to strengthen the peace of the region. The one final remark I would say is that in contrast to the early years of diplomacy, there is less of a tendency to focus it on Kashmir per se, and much more of a tendency to focus it on war, pre war prevention. Desi, thank you. That was kind of an incredible uh, kind of journey through, <coughs> through history. Ambassador Haqqani, uh, your views. Oh, well, thank you very much. And before I start, let me pay my own tribute to Howard Schaefer, whom I first met 35 years ago. And while I did not attend his uh, classes at uh, Georgetown, he was kind enough to tutor me, uh, if you remember, when I arrived in Sri Lanka as a 36-year-old ambassador uh, for political reasons from Pakistan. Uh, exile was probably my destiny, so that was a different kind of exile. And I used to come a lot for tea to the ambassador's residence. Uh, Daisy was ambassador there. And how he would uh, run me through many, many things during those long tea uh, conversations when you were not necessarily with us because you were uh, out there being ambassador. Uh, so Howard Schaefer had a profound influence on, on, on me. I've read all his books. And we continue to have discussions about India, Pakistan, uh, and other matters uh, until his uh, final days. And uh, I miss him greatly. Uh, uh, and I am grateful for whatever he taught me over these years. Uh, in his book in 2009, <clears throat> he wrote, and that's the only reason I was seeing my phone, so the young people here who thought, ah, the guy's checking his messages, no, it's not proper to do that, and I wasn't doing that. I just, I just saved it on, on, on my phone so that I could read it out instead of bringing the whole book here. Uh, he, he, he basically said it was an optimistic comment in that otherwise uh, complex book about uh, the, uh, the diplomacy uh, of India, Pakistan, or keeping them apart and the US role in it. And he said, and I quote, Indian and Pakistani position on the terms of a settlement have grown closer over the past few years. Now remember, this is being written in 2009. A quiet shove by Washington may be more likely than before to help push the two governments over the elusive finish line they have never been able to cross on their own. And the critical part Pakistan plays in the war on terrorism has added to the importance of a Kashmir settlement to major American interests in South Asia and beyond. The 10 years that have elapsed since then, of course, uh, have uh, contradicted that optimism. And basically, if you remember, that was a time when General Musharraf had been negotiating with India. Uh, there was this so-called Track 2. Uh, a new civilian government had been elected, and it was assumed that the new civilian government will carry forward that process because it was very enthusiastic. And then Mumbai happened. The terrorist attacks in Mumbai happened. And the whole process ended. But even before that, 
Let me say something about the inner workings of Pakistan here. Uh, I took over, before I took over as ambassador to the US, I was appointed ambassador at large. And I was asked by the new civilian government to go to the foreign ministry and take over the portfolio of negotiations over Kashmir that were taking place between the Musharraf government and the Indians, the so-called track two. And when I arrived, the very brilliant Riyaz Mohammad Khan, who was foreign secretary, uh, looked at me and he said, I said, you know, I need all the documents relating to the conversations, whatever has been agreed on, so we can move forward from where. And he said, I think you've come to the wrong place. You need to go and see the army chief. Uh, a civilian government has been elected. Uh, there's a foreign office. The foreign office should have known what the negotiations were, and that's what normal countries do. The negotiations then, wherever you've reached, you pass it on to the next government. And I went and saw the army chief, General Kiani at that time, who turned around and who said to me, well, since this was all happening informally and privately, why don't we go to zero point? Which basically means, why don't we start over again? And that led me to, th to a conclusion that has become even firmer now that I'm no longer in Pakistan's government and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, totally independent to think about things, that the solution of Kashmir has always been relatively secondary, especially to the Pakistani military. For them, uh, the problem is uh, trying to uh, create a, 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 an impression to the rest of the world and to Pakistan's public itself that India and Pakistan are in a conflict and there is equality of the two in that conflict. Now, of course, when in economic terms and other uh, uh, ways, Pakistan has fallen farther behind India, <clears throat> uh, and especially after 71, uh, the nuclear option is the only option. And so Pakistan has maintained parity in nuclear weapons. But since nuclear weapons cannot be used lightly, therefore terrorism is a subconventional option under the umbrella of the, uh, of the, uh, of the nuclear option. So the old paradigm in which it was assumed that if we can find a solution, let these two countries bring them together, get them to split the difference, and we can have a settlement over Kashmir. And then once Kashmir is settled, they'll go to a more normal relationship, I think no longer applies. Uh, 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 over time, a zero-sum game has developed at least on the Pakistani side. So for example, uh, uh, they want Kashmir even if there is no uh, a sort of way that they can have all of it. Uh, all the negotiations, going back to 1964, the famous discussion, were about how to split the difference. And that is what negotiations are. Negotiations are, I ask for 10, you offer me one, we settle for five, six, something like that. And that is not likely to happen here. So then what do we have right now? Well, we have three different things. One is a crisis in Kashmir. The disaffection that was seen in 1964, uh, well, the people who were 19 years old then are not 19 years old now, but there are other 19 year olds who are as disaffected. And that is a problem of India's management of the territory of Kashmir that it controls. Ironically, there is a similar problem on the Pakistani side. The recent Freedom House report, for example, showed that Pakistan's, uh, the, the part of Kashmir that is under Pakistan's control has uh, even less freedoms uh, then say, for example, the Indian side of Kashmir has. And so it is a problem for both countries to resolve, provide better governance and find a way so that the people that they um, rule over uh, are happier than they are at the moment. So the disaffection is one basket, I would say. Second is the basket which I said was terrorism, this basket of issues. Terrorism has made Pakistan uh, less able to get the international support it used to get. Uh, a lot of uh, factors have changed. For example, the last UN resolution on Kashmir was passed in 1957. Uh, I was one year old at that time. In 1957, I don't have any recollection of it, by the way. In, ni now, uh, in 1957, the United Nations membership was a very small membership. And if Pakistan went to the UN today, hoping to get a similar resolution, I don't think it could. Now with 193 members, it's unlikely that we would get a similar resolution. So while legally it is correct that the resolution still stands, the realities around the world have changed. Somebody will someday say, it's, if it's all about UN resolutions, a 1957 resolution passed by a handful of countries at the height of the Cold War does not have the same significance that a contemporary resolution would have. So let's discuss this resolution all over again. And there, 
that resolution becomes less important as our talking point. Um, and terrorism has eroded the support that Pakistan could have got from the international community, even on human rights violations uh, on the Kashmir, uh, on the Indian controlled uh, in the Indian controlled parts of Kashmir. Uh, the third category is the India-Pakistan relationship. So it's uh, I would say the basket of issues are handling of Kashmir by the respective controlling governments, the disaffection, both on the Pakistani side and the Indian side of Kashmir. Uh, both sides have actually human rights violations to contend with. Both sides have to deal with issues of not treating their populace well. Uh, both sides find excuses. Uh, from the Pakistani point of view, it's quote unquote, India's occupation of Kashmir that causes the problem. From the Indian side, uh, 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 the, the Pakistani support of terrorists uh, uh, justifies the repression. And then there is the India-Pakistan relationship. I personally feel that the India-Pakistan relationship uh, actually uh, is a product of a unrealistic competition in the minds of a, uh, a, a military that dominates domestic politics and domestic economics uh, in Pakistan. Uh, on the Indian side, unfortunately, now uh, religious sentiment and sectarianism and politics based on that sectarianism is also fueling antipathy towards Pakistan. Uh, I call this the Pakistanization of India in some ways. But we must understand that this is not about a dispute causing a poor relationship, but a poor relationship making the dispute more significant than it would otherwise have been. As far as the recent uh, issue is concerned, after the, look, uh, in the past, especially in 1999, when the first time Pakistan's action caused a serious situation between, in India and Pakistan, the whole world was, uh, took it much more seriously. Uh, President Clinton got involved personally, it was the 4th of July, it should have been his day of uh, barbecuing with his family, but he accepted Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's request to come and meet with him to try and get the Kargil Heights uh, uh, vacated so that the crisis will not escalate to the nuclear level. Now I think in 20 years, everybody has understood that there are attention getting moves and there are serious warlike moves. And, and so if it's an attention getting move, like an attack here, a strike there to try and get attention, then maybe we do not need the same level of crisis diplomacy that we needed then. And that's exactly what happened this time. Yeah. Uh, even after the last time, when the Indians did the so-called surgical strike, uh, the Pakistanis decided that the way they will deal with it and not escalate is by saying, what strike? No strike took place here. So just deny that something had happened. And this time they said, yeah, they came, they dropped some bombs, hit a few trees, no harm done. And so I think that was that that is the new dynamic that, that is taking place. What will bring India and Pakistan to a level of negotiation and discussion that goes beyond just crisis diplomacy? I think that is a subject for a conversation that Professor Nurdin can ensure is the topic for next year's conference so that we can go deeper into this discussion. Ambassador, thank you. Um, I think what, what concerns a lot of uh, folks is that we don't always recognize which category the incident is. Is it in the attention-seeking category or is it in the um, something much more serious category? And I think that's what we're trying to tackle here. Just uh, to level set, we're going to go till 5.20. Um, at the latest, we are going to take some questions from the audience. Um, so we have a lot to accomplish in a fairly short period of time. Dhruva, over to you. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, First of all, I just want to say I'm honored to be on this panel uh, with three very distinguished diplomats. Um, and I, uh, really, in some ways, I, I have a bit of imposter syndrome here sitting, sitting on this panel with them. Uh, I also want to uh, honor the legacy of Howard Schaefer, who you know, I, I got to know as well, and, and whose books I would really uh, compliment uh, and, and recommend to all of you, including his uh, biographies, not just Chester Bowles, but also uh, Ellsworth Bunker, his India at the Global High Table, co-authored with Ambassador Tazy Schaefer, which came out recently, uh, and Limits of Influence on, on Kashmir, as well as a book about Pakistan. Um, 
Also good to be back at Georgetown where I did my master's. Strangely enough, I'm embarrassed to say this is my first time back here in seven years uh, after finishing, eight years after finishing my master's, uh, despite uh, my living for a while in DC. So it's, it's good to be back. The, um, the development office would probably like I know, to talk they, to you. I know, they'd like to well. talk to you. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and the alumni office. Yeah. And also, I do also want to highlight that like one of the panelists in the last session, Sujoy Bose, I'm also a returnee to India and I've spent the last three years there. And I, like, like many of you, I know who are students from India, uh, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Now, India, Pakistan. Uh, I would uh, endorse everything that we have heard so far from the other panelists. Uh, and I will just briefly make a few points. Some of it may seem somewhat repetitive, but certainly complementary, I think, to, to what they have said, to, I think, set the stage for, for why we are in the situation we are in today. First of all, partition and independence in 1947. We have to go back to that. I'm, I'm sorry about it. But two things I think are important to keep in mind, uh, which is at independence in 1947, India and Pakistan were created, but they were, uh, they were unequal in size, in resources, uh, and there was this power disparity from the outset. And this is important to recognize. The second, uh, I think, important factor is that while the independence movement that led to Indian independence was not a revolutionary movement and resulted in a rather status quo oriented state, the two nation theory in some, that, that led to that partition created a, cer a certain revisionist sentiments that, that have been sustained. Um, the, these two factors I think are important to keep in mind because it explains why despite being the smaller of the two parties, Pakistan has often been the instigator of, uh, of, of, of tensions between them and, and both Ambassador Tazi Schaefer and Ambassador Hussein Akhani detailed that. Uh, this has been followed often not just by uh, an instigation from the Pakistani side, and it, but also often an Indian response, leading to third party mediation. Uh, initially, it was the United Nations that took a role. In the mid-1960s, the Soviet Union, in fact, organized um, uh, the Tashkent uh, summit in 1965. And from the 1990s onwards, it's largely been the United States playing that role. Although in recent, in recent years, a number of other actors have also intervened. Now, three things again to keep in mind in what has progressed in the last few years. One, the power disparity has widened in India's favor. First, following the bifurcation of Pakistan in the 1971 war and the creation of Bangladesh. And secondly, after India's economic liberalization after the 1990s that have given India far greater resources. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, the Pakistani economy today is about $300 billion, the GDP of, of Pakistan. India grows by about $200 billion a year. So every one and a half years, roughly, India is adding a Pakistan to its economy. Uh, the Pakistani economy today is smaller than, than that of one Indian state, Maharashtra. Um, the second thing that has changed is that the means have, that Pakistan has used have changed over time. Uh, in the past, in 1965, it, it, there was an infiltration followed by a military intervention, Operation Grand Slam. Uh, in the 1990s, we, we saw a, a, a revolution in, the, in, in, in Kashmir that was uh, supported uh, by, by outside entities. In 1999, we saw an incursion in Kargil of, of limited, a limited tract of unpopulated territory. Um, and then we saw a series of terrorist attacks in the mid 2000s. Those terrorist attacks now have, uh, af which was punctuated in 2008, there was another small period of between 2010 and 2013 where we saw a number of terrorist attacks. But more recently, we have seen those attacks targeting Indian military and police facilities. Uh, so very deliberately non-civilian targets. The final change that's taken place is nuclearization. Uh, starting in the 70s and 80s, when both India and Pakistan had low level nuclear programs, but really coming out into the open after the nuclear tests of 1998. So these factors, again, are, are important to keep in mind. The, the widening power disparity in India's favor, the changing means Pakistan is using for provocations, and the nuclearization of the subcontinent. And this has created a bit of a puzzle for Indian policymakers. How do you compel a revisionist nuclear arms state to accept the status quo with very li little, almost no positive levers, there's almost no direct trade, no people-to-people -people contacts, very, li very limited, and almost no negative levers <coughs> given the presence of nuclear weapons by Pakistan. And this is the puzzle that the Indian government has to contend with. For a long time, engagement was seen as a viable option, and there have been periods of that. In 1999, the Prime Minister Vajpayee went to Lahore, and there was a Lahore Declaration. This was followed by the Kargil War. And there were summits at Agra, 
There was a, 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 a dialogue in the 2000s supplemented by a back-channel dialogue that Ambassador Hussein Akhani spoke about. And between 2014 and 2016, we also saw a period of engagement between the two sides. But there is a growing belief in India, for right or wrong, that this engagement serves very little, if, if any, purpose. And there's growing frustration in the Indian electorate, and this is buttressed by public opinion polls, that engagement is not a way, does nothing to actually change Pakistani behavior. And so what we have seen really since 2016, since the summer of 2016, has been India trying to push the agenda in terms of what can be done under the nuclear umbrella. We saw the surgical strikes in, in, in 2016 and the air strikes more recently. Uh, there's also a belief, correct or not, that these tensions if they, that, that do uh, result from Indian responses will actually hurt Pakistan more than they hurt India. And again, this is a very risky proposition, but it is, I think, a growing belief. The fact that Pakistan has had to close its airspace, its entire airspace, for much longer than Pakistan, uh, India had to close uh, the airspace over three, just three states indicates, is, is indicative of the fact that Pakistan may have more to lose. And the belief is that this over time, there's no silver bullet, will slowly compel the managers of security in Pakistan, uh, the real sources of power, to change their behavior. As of now, there's no evidence, real evidence of that. Uh, and the fact is, I think, going, going against this, that Pakistan still matters to the rest of the world. It matters to the United States for, as part of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, or drawdown from Afghanistan. It matters to China, increasingly, as a destination for major investments as part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And it matters to states in the Gulf, for example, who have a series of complex, both economic and security ties with Pakistan. So Pakistan is not becoming irrelevant overnight. It is able to leverage that. But I think these are the trends that we are seeing take place uh, over the last few years. So I hopefully that's some context. That's terrific. Let me, let me dive a little bit deeper on the US role. And I have a separate question for each of you, but I'll start with Ambassador Haqqani first, which is, can the US still play uh, a role, either facilitating or um, mediating, maybe too strong a word, as the U.S.-India relationship gets stronger and as the U.S.-Pakistani relationship deteriorates? I think even when the U.S.-Pakistan relationship was at its peak, uh, Pakistanis were always, the, the, the Pakistani establishment, not Pakistanis like me, but Pakistani establishment was circumspect about America's role. They wanted the Americans to help uh, sort of diffuse a particular situation of their creation. And there's a famous episode, you know, in 1965 when Pakistan started the war, uh, Dean Rusk sort of, uh, his re response to President Ayub Khan when he called him up and said, well, you have to organize the ceasefire. He said, I wasn't in on the takeoff. Why do you want me to be in on the crash landing? Mm -hmm. So that's why the, 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 the peace conference went to the Soviet Union rather than, uh, but, but then at the same time, uh, you asked, you said about the attention getting, here's the pr uh, dilemma. India is trying to get attention over the terrorism issue. Pakistan is trying to get attention for the Kashmir dispute or for what it says uh, are the uh, issues inside Kashmir uh, and, and, and the assumption that the people of Kashmir would rather be with Pakistan than with, the, with India. So the US role becomes less and less uh, tenable from the Pakistani point of view. Hmm. Um, uh, but if, they, if their chestnuts are in the fire, they would definitely want anybody to, to take them out. So uh, they would run to China, they'll come to the US. But will they listen to the US and say, our strategy is not working? I think that the way Pakistani nationalism has been defined, and you can, any, anybody, you can see it on Facebook, you can see it on Twitter, the younger generation of Pakistanis, except those who have chosen to understand the problem and say, hey, you know, this is not the kind of Pakistan we aspire for. The rest of them are all kind of, you know, it's, it's about, we will destroy India one of these days. We will settle this score one of these days. You know, nobody wants to understand, for example, the size difference, etc. Uh, and the nuclear weapons, uh, have given Pakistan not the confidence and security that they should have. Instead, all that, that has happened is that the Pakistani military and, its, uh, and, and those who support it and who are its product in the political arena, including, unfortunately, Prime Minister Imran Khan, they think that the nuclear weapons actually make Pakistan invulnerable, so therefore the room for pinpricks is greater. Mm. Um, as I see it, 
Uh, yes, there is need for Pakistan in the peace process in Afghanistan, but either way, if the peace process falls apart or the peace process succeeds and the Americans leave Afghanistan, either way, the American interest in and leverage over Pakistan will diminish further. Mm. And Pakistan has already cast its lot with China. So the United States will at some point have to think, are we going into a situation where we've tried to be the balancer for a long time, but one side really just doesn't like us? Mm. And we have economic and other interests with the other side. Are we going to risk them? And I think that uh, Prime Minister Modi and people on the right in India, uh, the right wing, actually is pushing that line. They say, you know, the Americans have to choose. And it may not be easy. It doesn't come naturally to American diplomats to choose between conflicting sides like that when both sides have some arguments that are valid. But I think that that is where it is headed rather than in a direction in which America will continue to be uh, the preeminent power negotiating uh, between or facilitating negotiations between yeah. both. That's a great, great segue into what I want to ask Ambassador Schaefer, which is, is there really an appetite in Washington to, to even tackle this set of issues? You know, um, I, we've been going back, we're talking about a lot of history from the 60s uh, forward, but I, I would say in the last decade, the American interest in this issue has declined uh, substantially. And in fact, the muscle memory of the State Department, for example, to tackle this issue and the capacity is actually quite small. Uh, and and I, I want you to tackle that a little bit, Ambassador Schaefer, because you know the standard U.S. response now, at least publicly, is it came down to, to three words: the time, place, and manner is really for the the two countries to decide. Anything Kashmir related, and even anything India-Pakistan related. I once said those three words out of order. And I got uh, media calls by reporters saying, has there been a change in, in US policy? It, it is such a um, hands-off, distant, and disinterested um, approach. Do you disagree with that? Or, or no, I don't disagree with that. I think, I think that is basically correct. But I also think uh, that this uh, is what leads you uh, to look on crisis management uh, as the one form of diplomacy that the U.S. might have an appetite for, because if uh, the India and Pakistan were to miscalculate their way into a nuclear war, that would have consequences for us and everybody else. And that becomes something that is worth investing time and effort in. Um, a couple of years back, you know, like maybe two, um, <laughs> during one of the periods when India and Pakistan were having difficulty dealing with each other in the context of the Indus Waters Treaty, which still stands as the most success successful piece of India-Pakistan diplomacy, and which was carried out with uh, a role from the United States and from the World Bank. Um, there, the, uh, somebody in senior positions in the State Department uh, wanted to look into whether um, the United States should get involved in breaking the logjam over when and how the Indus Waters Commission should meet. Um, and um, a friend of mine was asked to staff this out. And I have to tell you, my reaction was, unless you think you can actually do something with that, don't go there because um, there is nothing that this is likely to generate except for more argument. Uh, and as long as the Indus Waters Treaty is actually working, and by the way, part of what makes that such a brilliant diplomatic success is the fact that the whole Indus Waters Treaty was designed so that the Indian and the Pakistani water authorities would not have to deal with each other all day, every day. It was a divorce. It was not a joint custody arrangement. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting point. Um, Dhruva, we talk about the appetite within the State Department. Mm -hmm. What's, in your honest assessment, what's the appetite in New Delhi for the United States to play any role? Right. So, you know, I think there is a, I would distinguish between two kinds of roles. 
There's a role which is mediation, which even if well-intentioned, uh, shrinks the power disparity between India and Pakistan. And this is what, what India has for many years been trying to deflect from. Uh, there was an attempt, for example, under the early Obama administration for Richard Holbrook to play a bigger role uh, in brokering um, uh, negotiations between India and Pakistan. And India staunchly resisted that. Uh, again, not because of any belief that there was ill intent on the part of the Obama administration, but because that mediating role would, would diminish that power disparity. And so India has insisted on, it, on these negotiations between India and Pakistan being bilateral. Uh, this is very different from something else, which is the US intervening in a manner that puts greater pressure on Pakistan. And we saw a bit of that in the aftermath of the Pulwama attacks and the Balakot strikes. Um, so I think that kind of, you know, we saw hints of it starting with Cargill, with Bill Clinton's role uh, at the Blair House uh, meeting with Nawaz Sharif. Uh, but, um, but I think if, if we see something like that, India would not see that as necessarily unwelcome. If you think about... I think there's yeah. something else about this. This yeah. is an absolutely classic negotiating strategy. It's not unique to India. It's very much one of the things that the Trump administration clings to. You always want to be the big dog in the particular negotiation. Yep. So India has traditionally wanted to deal with its neighbors bilaterally, which by definition meant India would be the biggest power in the room. Um, and that leads you straight to this idea that you don't want a mediation which uh, diminishes the power disparity. The flip side of that, though, is if you expect your negotiation to go anywhere, at some point, the person you're talking to has to have the motivation to say yes. Right, but I think what we're missing, I'm, I'm coming back to Ambassador Haqqani's first bucket, crisis in Kashmir. Yes. I mean, what, what would happen uh, if the Americans actually said something about that? Well, that would be a good thing, actually, to try and advise both, but it'll have to be done very quietly. It'll have to be advised to both, and I'll tell you why. Again, the Indians will take offense over being told what to do in what they consider to be their sovereign territory. By the way, so would the Pakistanis. They don't want to be told that, you know what, why don't you give voting rights to the people of Gilgit and Baltistan? I mean, since you've more or less incorporated that into your country, you're signing deals with China. You, on the one hand, say it's disputed territory, so therefore they can't have voting rights. Uh, they can't, and the people of Azad, Jammu, and Kashmir can also not have voting rights in Pakistan's elections, etc. They don't have a representation in parliament at, and anything else. And on the other hand, you say we can't do that because it's a disputed territory. On the other hand, you station your forces there, you keep building cantonments there, you allow the Chinese to come in there. So uh, both sides, uh, for their respective regions, uh, have political arguments that stop them from taking advice from others. But since I am from the region, and while I'm from Pakistan, I think a lot of Indians think that I'm a reasonable Pakistani, which they don't think about many others, unfortunately. <laughs> it would be my advice to the Indians that they really do need to talk to the people of Kashmir. They really do need to resolve the issues that are within the uh, region that they control. They cannot be a oppressive occupant and then expect that those people will not be infiltrated uh, by a hostile power that is bent upon trying to use them uh, to, to ch ch change the status quo. Lastly, uh, whenever there is a status quo and a revisionist power in conflict, and then they have the size difference, it usually favors the uh, revisionist power when others get involved. And uh, because the size difference gets mitigated, other factors happen. So that is the reason why Indians remain so averse to any ideas. But it is something that does need to be conveyed to them, however quietly, however privately, because the situation there is not necessarily something that can last like this forever. Let me, let me ask if there are questions in the audience. And I want to go to a student. Sorry, first, if I, that's generally the preference. Student here? Yeah, please go ahead. There's a microphone here. Hi, I'm a student at the George Washington University. Um, my question was, we have, we, we're talking about crises and crisis management. I, I think an important part of crisis management is the proactive phase where we look at 
monitor situations. And we've had two statements made this week, one by Prime Minister Khan, where he says that we actually would like it if the right-wing government would win in India, because we think that that would be the best chance of achieving some sort of peace and normalcy between India and Pakistan. And there is a history, a lot of different people have said it, but I'm curious as to your take on why you think he said it. The second statement is by Amit Shah, where he says that we shall remove all infiltrators from this country and we shall welcome with open arms all Hindus, Buddhists, and Sikhs. And in terms of the Indo-Bangladeshi relationship, do you see that statement having any impact and what do you think the Bangladeshis are thinking about right now? Hmm. And let me just ask if there's any other students. We'll take one more student question. No? Okay, go ahead. Let's, that was a, two very complex, complex questions. Who wants to jump in first? I will address the other one, but very briefly, which is uh, we are in election season um, and domestic politics has its own logic. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that all statements, and by the way, I, uh, uh, Modi in 2014 was asked about some of the statements he had made on the campaign trail. And he said, in you know, paraphrasing, that he said, uh, don't take everything that is said in the fever of the campaign, literally. I'll leave it at that. Um, my comment on that is that actually those who intend to run countries uh, should build credibility. And this attitude, uh, whether it is by a politician in India or in Pakistan, I think it's not a healthy attitude uh, that you actually try to aggravate. That is how, that, that's what happened in the 1940s, for God's sake. A lot of things were said that were not necessarily neither side actually wanted uh, uh, to be the basis of future policy of anybody. And so I think that irresponsible statements need to be avoided and scholars need to call out irresponsible statements instead of just saying that, well, it happens. No, it shouldn't happen even if it happens. As far as the first part is concerned, Prime Minister Khan, I don't know how much you followed him other than his cricket career. Uh, he, he, he makes contradictory statements. So on the one hand, he you know, used to criticize Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif for, as quote unquote Modi ka yaar, a friend of Modi, because a friend of Modi cannot be a friend of Pakistan. That was the idea. Uh, in the campaign, he kept repeating that. Uh, now he thinks that Prime Minister Modi winning the election might be better for him. Uh, I don't know on which occasion he meant it seriously. And so, uh, again, while I'm prepared to call him out on it, I would say that don't get too worried about his comment. It's not that the people of Pakistan want a certain outcome of the Indian election. I think the Indian election is for the Indian people to decide. Yeah. Can I answer her question about Bangladesh? You, you may in 30 seconds or less. The government of Bangladesh has a very close relationship with the government of India, and they're not disposed to look for trouble where there isn't any. If it doesn't lead to trouble, I think this will. Uh, Dhruv will be proven right. He is right that the election statements, etc., are not always completely taken seriously. He shouldn't have said it, but now that he has said it, I think there'll be enough people explaining it away, and by the time policy making comes, I don't think it's going to be policy. All right, we're gonna we're, we're we're gonna have to wrap. We're at, we are at five twenty, and I'm gonna just ask uh, the panelists. Again, you've talked about a sixty to seventy year cycle here. Help us end on a note of optimism. <laughs> how how does this end constructively, positively? Maybe that's for next year's conference. But um, closing thoughts, and we really have to do this quickly. I, I wish I had an answer to that. Uh, no, I mean, I, as I see it, we've seen some trends in the long run. I would be optimistic in the sense, only in the sense that I, f I think India and Pakistan have found ways, and Ambassador Schaefer correctly pointed this out, to, I think, communicate in a manner that sometimes from the outside does not seem very uh, uh, moderate or responsible, but I think there, some signal, there has been a learning curve in terms of the signaling on both sides, and I take some confidence in that. Thank you. I'm not sure it's such a bad thing to aim at managing problems. And I'm not sure India and Pakistan are going to get much better than that in the meantime. So why not focusing on getting good and maybe even getting better at managing problems? Really good point. Optimism is, optim optimism is good. Realism is better. 
I think that uh, both sides are getting more and more realistic and that has created a kind of a balance. So neither side is about to uh, uh, use the nukes day after tomorrow and that's the, that's the cause for optimism. And I think there is a younger generation in Pakistan that realizes that Pakistan has to have a different paradigm for its future than the one that we have had in the past. And I think a younger generation in India is also more interested in becoming entrepreneurs, making more money, being happier and healthier, and basically eliminating somebody because of their religion or because there was a political dispute between their grandfathers and somebody else's grandfathers in the 1940s. I think that that generation will definitely change the equation. Let's, be, uh, let's wait for them to take over. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.